Every so often, the Foundation gets a tip-off about an anomalous object rather than discovering it through their global surveillance network. Tip-offs aren't common, because few people know how to even get in contact with the Foundation directly. But when they do, it's always a relief. The agents and mobile task forces that are sent to investigate and retrieve possible SCPs usually walk in blind. There's no telling what they might find. But when a tip-off, report, or informant from one of the groups of interest comes in and spills the beans, the brave frontliners of the Foundation usually have a slightly better idea of what they're tackling. Usually. Sometimes they get complacent and end up underestimating or going in unprepared. And when that happens, well, the consequences can be disastrous. Way back in 1990, the Foundation received an unexpected tip-off from some of its contacts based on the island of Hong Kong. It wasn't much. Just a location and a general description of the effects told discreetly over the phone. The contact was one of some 50,000 Chinese residents of a particular neighborhood in Hong Kong, the infamous Kowloon Walled City. The city was originally a Chinese military fort on the island of Hong Kong. When the island was sold to the British Empire at the end of the 19th century, the fort was converted into massive, densely packed apartment buildings and quickly became an enclave for the Chinese. When Japan occupied Hong Kong during World War II, tens of thousands of ethnic Chinese on the island took refuge in the massive apartment blocks of the slum. There was no government, no police, no laws. The dozens of floors were controlled by gangs and drug dealers, but it was better than being homeless. And of course, the residents were incredibly suspicious of any authorities. You can imagine why the Foundation was reticent to send some of their best men into a densely packed civilian area that was likely to be hostile to their presence. Their contact informed them that the anomalous object was a small relic of some kind, with strange, terrifying powers. It was located deep in the heart of the walled city, and it might even be responsible for the very city's existence. Foundation Command considered that the alternative was letting 50,000 people reside inside of an uncontained anomaly, and decided they'd send someone to investigate. They picked troops from Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, the Mole Rats. The Mole Rats are some of the Foundation's most trustworthy operatives. They're a task force specially trained and equipped to operate in dangerous and anomalous environments, particularly those that are underground or underwater. Whether it's an undersea cave system or an endless claustrophobic basement, the Mole Rats perform search, rescue, containment, and even recovery in these terrifying places. They seem like the natural fit to be the ones to lead the expedition while exploring and finding out what in the world had caused the Kowloon Walled City. The team landed in Hong Kong on June 3rd, led by one Gordon Richards, a member of Zeta-9. He kept an extensive personal diary, as most agents do, and from it, the Foundation was able to learn what SCP-184 truly was. The first impression Richards had of the Walled City while exploring it with his partner Henry was pure disgust. It was a densely packed slum that was largely made of trash and refuse, covered in filth and stinking to high heaven. The suits that the team wore protected them from any hazardous material or danger, but it was still a vile experience moving through the cramped streets and corridors of the ghetto. At one point, Richard's partner was walking through an area piled knee-deep in trash when the floor gave out, dumping him into a cesspool. On their first day, they learned practically nothing from the locals. The residents of the walled city were suspicious of outsiders. They'd either avoid the agents or throw trash and insults at them from afar in Cantonese and sometimes Mandarin. But Richards did manage to catch whispers in some of the bars that peppered the city. There was something strange in the center of the mass, something that sounded nothing short of anomalous. Foundation agents assisted Hong Kong police officers in conducting raids overnight, hoping to find more information. In the morning, the Mole Rats returned to investigate and found the first evidence of something actually anomalous affecting several of the tiny apartments. 
From the outside, they looked like the same ragged shanties as the other hundred square foot apartments, but they were far too big from the inside. Henry had seemed spooked since his fall into the cesspit the day prior. The other agents tried talking to him, but it didn't help much, and he spent most of the day in a strange fugue, muttering to himself. Richards told him to knock it off, but never reported it, feeling bad for the new kid. The next day would be spent in the sewers, trying to find a direct route to the center of the city, where the object was being held. Richards went into the sewer with a fellow agent, but found nothing except more waste and filth. They were unable to get on the radio with the rest of the team inside the actual building until they came out early the next day, after spending almost a full day underground. They were quickly pulled out by other agents and briefed while they had been in the sewers. Henry and another agent had been exploring the central portion of the city. That's when they were rushed by an angry mob. Dozens of people attacked before they even had a chance to retaliate. Both were viciously beaten, but Henry was dragged off deeper into the city, and the other agent was injured during his retreat back to base. When they could no longer hear Henry's screams on the radio, several armed agents rushed in to extract him. That's when they heard Henry's radio again. He was screaming and rambling incoherently, sounding like he was hallucinating about the city being alive when the radio cut out again. The search team was shocked by the sight of Henry rounding the corner, running at full pace and screaming without his helmet. He pushed an agent aside before smashing right through one of the weak, thin garbage walls, falling six stories onto a pile of metal scrap. The sight was gruesome, and it took them hours to recover his body. Zeta-9 was done screwing around. They were going to round up the city's leaders and find this anomaly before it killed anyone else. Over the next day or so, the agents, aided by the Hong Kong Police Department, rounded up many of the city's elders and community leaders, pulling them from their apartments and shanties. Zeta-9 worked on interrogating them for information, while Richards provided the muscle. The first person they pulled was a member of the Chinese Triads, one of the gangs that functionally ran the city. When he didn't cooperate, the agents broke his legs, and he suddenly became a lot more talkative. He explained that the anomaly was called the Builder, and no one quite knew where it came from or how it worked. The closest he had ever come was standing guard outside rooms while it worked, and that the city elders would know more. When he brushed off Henry's death, Richards broke his jaw. The next person was an ancient-looking Chinese man named Long Wen, one of the city's reclusive elders. He was indomitable. No matter what Richards did, he wouldn't give in under abuse or torture. But when one of the agents suggested that Zeta-9 pay a visit to his family, he immediately opened up. He told them that the Builder was kept in an old temple that the city had grown around. It was highly secret, and only a few people could look upon it without going mad. He had tried to show Henry so that the Foundation wouldn't take it away, but obviously that hadn't gone quite as planned. When asked where it was, Long Wen explained that as soon as the agents had arrived, they had moved it deep inside the city, where no one would be able to get to it. But Zeta-9 took that as a challenge. Tomorrow, they were moving into the city's temple and not coming out without that anomaly. Richards and the rest of the Mole Rats prepared themselves for the expedition over the following few days. They were going to venture deep into the heart of the Kowloon Walled City, far away from any supply lines or external foundation support. They made sure they went in heavily armed, with their suits life support enabled, and prepared for every possibility. They departed on June 8th, heading straight into the belly of the city, where Henry had been abducted by the mob. At first it seemed strange, but not overtly anomalous, the same dingy, damp apartments full of garbage, but eventually they came upon what they were looking for. A small, tiny temple, Buddhist in style and design. It was made out of stone and wood, with a small Buddha statue out front. It was the only thing that looked remotely out of place, otherwise surrounded by shanties and cobbled together homes. In the words of the great David Brin, this must be the place. At first, it was nothing new. The temple was too big on the inside, but it was nothing they hadn't seen in the hundred other rooms in this massive building. A small shrine, a few seats here and there, altars, 
But then Richards and the other agents noticed something. A sliding door built into the wall of the tiny 10-foot temple. It made no sense. A door would exit out into the apartment right next door. When they opened it, they found a hallway leading deeper into the structure made of the same wood and rice paper that the temple was constructed from. It was long, too. At this point, they should have been deep into the other apartments in the building, more so than any other room they had checked before. As they traveled down the corridor, they found more sliding doors lining the walls, more temple rooms, altars, and meditation chambers, all recreated and rearranged by the anomaly. It was like someone built 12 whole temples inside this one tiny structure, expanding ever inward. That must have been why they called this thing the Builder, whatever it was. The Mole Rats knew that this place was bound to be gigantic, and set up a small base camp in the original temple to stop any of the residents from getting the jump on them. Then they got their suits sealed, their equipment rigged up, and went to work exploring the various corridors, hallways, and temples that had grown out of this anomaly. At first it was simple and repetitive, but things started to get strange after the sixth hour of exploration. The rooms began to thin out, until the mole rats were mostly exploring uninterrupted long hallways made out of bamboo and rice paper. They came upon a room with something inside it, another meditation chamber, but this time a small bronze Buddha statue was placed in the center of the room. It was the size of Richard's fist, and his team collected a sample before moving to the sliding door at the rear of the room. They opened it up and exited right back into a meditation room with a tiny fist-sized Buddha in the center. For a second, they thought they had been transported backward, but this Buddha didn't have any samples taken out of it. It was an identical copy of the room they had just entered through. Strange, but not unexpected. They didn't bother taking a sample and move to the next room, which was also a meditation chamber with a Buddha in the middle. All in all, they found 83 rooms in a row that were identical copies of that one chamber with the Buddha, connected by the sliding doors. After that experience and a few hallways later, they came upon another familiar sight a perfect recreation of the original altar room they had entered into the temple from, but with one difference. Rather than being made out of planks of wood and stone, this room seemed to be carved from a single massive piece of wood with no seams or breaks. There were no tool marks anywhere, and it looked as though it had been somehow naturally formed, but they did find a small collection of documents written in Chinese in the corner. They scanned the documents and sent digital copies back to HQ. The agents at the base responded. The anomaly had been designated SCP-184, and the temple goers seemed to think it was a gift from God. They allowed people to bring it into their apartments for a small payment and let it grow the space. Zeta-9 resolved to grab it and get out before it could expand the temple any further. They bunked down for the night to get some sleep. The next morning, they continued moving through the temple until they hit a branch in the road and split the team. Richards picked one hallway and set out on his own, climbing upwards. The walls in this section of the temple were irregular. They were undulating, wavy. The wood and rice had given way to hard stone hallways. Richard slipped into one of the rooms to rest for a while and found that all the furniture was made of beautiful green jade, despite being wonderfully soft. He rested on the jade bed for a while before continuing on. He wrote in the journal that he didn't feel well, disconnected from the environment, not like a usual mission. One of his team members had died, and the environment itself felt hostile. Without anyone else to talk to, he was thinking too much but it was just nerves. He signed the journal and kept moving. For the next hours and days, Richards continued on. His suit's ability to make food and water was running low. As he moved through the stone temple, he saw something out of the corner of his eye that wasn't there when he looked again. He heard voices that couldn't possibly be there. He'd been climbing for so long, he'd lost track of time. While climbing up the shaft, he finally saw light and darted through, only to enter a room filled with lit candles, not sunlight. Enraged, he smashed them all with his helmet, breaking the helmet to pieces. He sat and cried for a while before dropping something down the shaft to see how far it was to the bottom, but never heard it hit the floor. He 
he set his jaw. Screw containment. He had to find this thing and utterly destroy it. The next time he saw something, it was days later. His food and water had run out when he had found a hall filled with doors lining every surface. They all led back into the wall, but he noticed he was bleeding. The floor wasn't carpet, but razor-sharp stone pinpricks that had shredded the boots of his suit to ribbons along with his feet. He returned to climbing after patching himself up a little. He had to kill this thing somehow. The rest of the entries are disparate and unsigned. One of the rare coherent ones revealed that he was at the top of the shaft at something called the Hall to Forever, filled with light, and that he was going to kill the heart. Around the time these entries were written, the other members of Zeta-9 felt the temple shaking and cracking, growing unstable. They quickly evacuated, minutes before they saw the interior of the temple collapsing in on itself. The entire expanded area collapsed into the tiny space of the original altar room. Through the rubble, the members of Zeta-9 found Richard's journal along with a tiny metal object matching the descriptions of SCP-184. They never did find Richard's body. He went missing during the recovery, presumed killed in action. After it was brought back to base, Foundation researchers went to work on it. It was a tiny metal statuette in the shape of a dodecahedron. The metal it was made from was unknown, but tests revealed that it was magnetic and hard as brass. Experiments followed. They discovered that when they put SCP-184 inside an enclosed structure, like a room or building or even a cardboard box, it would expand the interior dimensions without making it grow larger. The effect was powerful. The rooms it was tested in would grow by hundreds of square meters every day. At first, it just moves the walls out, making the room up to three times bigger than it is. But after that, it gets strange. During a test in a small bedroom in a suburban home, after it grew the room three times in floor space, it began to create entirely new rooms. The researchers suddenly went in to find three kitchens, six bedrooms, a dozen bathrooms, and tens of closets. They were all fully furnished. SCP-184 was capable of copying materials from the rest of the building, but not particularly well. The appliances in the kitchen were made of wood or rock, and the furniture was limited to glass sofas and chairs. The rooms were oddly shaped as the house went on. At first, they were oval, but the deeper bedrooms were pentagonal and even star-shaped. They even found one bedroom that was a perfect sphere. Some of the doors led right into an empty wall, and the hallways changed in size and shape and led around into themselves like a labyrinth. The researchers quickly removed SCP-184 from the house and tried to figure out how to contain this thing. If there's one thing the Foundation is good at, it's locking things up in boxes. But locking this thing up in a box is the most dangerous thing they could possibly do. One researcher had an out-of-the-box idea. SCP-184 was placed between two electromagnets, which kept it floating in mid-air and made it impossible to pull away. That solved half the problem, and the Foundation knew exactly where to put it without enclosing it in a space. Only a few years after the events of Zeta-9's recovery, the Hong Kong government finally demolished the massive Kowloon walled city, replacing it with an open park commemorating the site with many statuaries and relics from the city. The Foundation made sure they were able to install SCP-184's electromagnets as another statuary inside a gazebo, finally containing SCP-184 right where it had been all along. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like eternally recursive home. Now go check out SCP-3008 Trapped in Ikea and SCP-2427 A Thing Full of Stuff for more anomalous locations you might never escape.